Hey guys, welcome to this podcast episode. And I've got a really special guest for you today, Larry Roberts, uh, CEO of and founder of Red Hat Media. And he is a pioneer in the AI space. He was, uh, I first met him in Pod Fest two years ago, and he was talking about ChatGPT. And this year he's evolved it into actually creating uh, Gen AI. And he's going to talk to us all about. Uh, AI in, in the creative and your media business. So Larry, welcome. Thank you so very much for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. I think we're going to have a really good conversation. Yeah. I know you and start off by telling the audience what you do, how you got into, and I'm really excited to dive into your knowledge and experience. Yeah, man. We'll get, we'll give you the revised version since this is a shorter show. But I got into podcasting way back. Actually, this is my 10th year. So now I've been podcasting for a decade. And prior to founding Red Hat Media, I was a business intelligence analyst in my corporate career. I was leveraging the Microsoft BI suite to do some in-depth analysis and forecasting. And we were pulling data from all of our different customers and it was all in different formats. And we had to take it out. We had to extract that data, reformat it, and then reload it into a cleaner database so that we could look at this data from a variety of different ways. And we were using AI algorithms in a lot of those predictive analytics. So I, I was familiar with AI to a certain degree long before Chad GPT jumped on the scene and everybody fell in love with AI as we know it today. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting because I remember your presentation two years ago in front of an audience of almost 150, 200 people plus. And it was talking about how you could use AI to create books. And so you talk about using AI to write a book in a week and kind yeah. of walk us through your process and how we can leverage it. Yeah. Honestly, the book that I wrote is right behind me here. It's up <laughs> shelves here. It's called Under the Red Hat, which it's really all about branding, but I used AI to write the vast majority of the book. I did write chapter three all by myself. So I'm pretty proud of that, <laughs> but I used AI to write the, the rest of it. And the reason why was I actually flew out to San Diego and I was doing a talk for an organization called EO or Entrepreneurs Organization. And I was doing a talk on AI. And after the talk, there was a happy hour. Everybody's hanging out and people were coming up going, hey man, great talk, really appreciate it. I'd love to buy your book. <laughs> I didn't have a book. So <laughs> I felt really exposed at the time because I have written other books, but they're all about podcasting. So I didn't necessarily have a book that was relevant to that audience. So. I had another talk that was booked about a, three or four weeks after that one. And I just knew I couldn't let myself get exposed like that again. So I got home and I was a little frustrated, but then it dawned on me. I was like, you're the AI guy, write, write a book with AI. So that's exactly what I did. I, I came up with a prompt that would allow me to get the structure or the outline of a book. And if you specify in the prompt how many chapters you want, it will actually lay out the book chapter by chapter for you, giving chapter headings, giving you the concept of each chapter, giving you a synopsis of each chapter. And then all you have to do essentially is have a conversation back and forth with, I use Chad GPT in this instance, with Chad GPT and do what we call chain prompting. So you take the output from a previous prompt and you use that output as part of your input for the next prompt. And then you use that output and you continue to build and build. And within a very short amount of time, about a week or so, maybe a week and a half at the most, I had my book. It was written and then all that was left was for me to format it and, uh, and get it published. With that outline that I wrote and fleshing out each chapter by having that conversation and chain prompting to get each chapter of the book. Now all that was left was to format it, lay it out, design a cover and use Amazon or KDP to publish the book. And within, before that next talk, so within about three, three and a half weeks, I had author copies in my hand of Under the Red Hat. It's not a difficult process. I've done it a couple of times now for some clients as well. And we've even taken it a little bit further now and evolved the process to where we're using some client data to actually write the book in their voice using their own writings. So as an example, I had a client that I wrote his book using 200 of his blog posts. He already had a blog he'd been writing for years and years and he wanted to convert it to a book. So. We took those blog posts and we uploaded those to Chad GPT. And actually what I ended up doing was creating a custom GPT that was built completely for his blog posts and for writing his book. And then we wrote his output from that, from those blog posts. And 
ended up producing a book there as well. So that, that's very shorthanded explanation of how we did it, but that's what you can do with these tools and ChatGPT and Claude and Llamas out there and Gemini's out there and Microsoft's got Copilot that's got chatbots and, and whatnot out there. So there's all these tools and all these AI agents that are out there at our disposal to do a wide variety of content creation. Yeah, which kind of a follow-up question was, because you talked about writing a book and still need like thumbnails and for YouTube channel. And so sure. past you had to have a video graphic editor, but talk about now AI's capabilities, because you were talking about from text or text to text, but now talk about text to picture and we will get into video later, but talk about. Yeah. Yeah. We're starting to see a lot more multimodal AI bots that are out there. Chat GPT is also multimodal, meaning that you can go text to text, you can go text to image. And eventually it's not here yet, at least not from OpenAI's perspective. We don't have that text to video option available to us yet, but they're working on it and they've released some videos <laughs> that are just mind blowing what they've done with some very simple prompts. But as far as the graphics are concerned, you can definitely do that. And I I've created some really cool images, even just using Chad GPT, which if I was going to refer you to a platform for image generation, Chad GPT would not be it. While it, it does a decent job, it's not really designed and they don't put a whole lot of emphasis on, on image generation mm -hmm. with their doll E application, which they integrated into Chad GPT. Now used to, it was two separate applications, but now. You can simply prompt chat GPT and get an image. But if you're going to do a lot of image generations, there's a ton of platforms out there that are, that will do it. But mid journey is probably my go-to if I'm really looking to do AI generated imagery. And the difference there is most of us that are familiar with AI right now, we've gotten to where we're fairly used to prompting. We're fairly used to putting in text and going, Hey, draw me a picture of a sunset on a beach and at the golden hour, and you're going to get this beautiful sunset and it's going to be on the beach. It's going to look amazing. But if you're going to do something in mid journey, the texting, the, the text prompts aren't quite as simple as that. You know, mid journey wow. has its own set of variables and its own types of prompting that you're going to use in order to generate the results that a lot of these people are looking for. If you're looking for consistent character generation, for example, if you're going to do yourself as a, as an AI image and you want to consistently look the same way. You really have to start understanding the variables, meaning the, the we'll call them parameters or variables that you can replace to define exactly how you want that image to look. And it's a totally different texting or prompting methodology than what you would traditionally use in a chat bot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fascinating. Uh, it's fascinating. It's good to know. Uh, I'll check out Mid Journey. Um, the other thing I remember this year you were talking about, because you AI, I remember AI was very clunky and then now it's actually the text is really seamless. And now the text video and you actually cloned your voice. I remember you cloned your voice <laughs> using Descript and then you created, I wasn't sure if you used Dolly or Mid Journey to create an avatar of yourself and you overlaid that voice with your, which is talk about how you can use AI. Now you can create AI avatars and I mean, potentially you could create these like 30 minute the videos that entertain or inform your sure. audience. <laughs> and actually, you mentioned that I use Descript. What I actually used was Eleven Labs. Oh, okay. Which Eleven Labs is, they specialize in cloning voices or having AI generated voices. And yeah. they go text to voice, which is really a tremendous platform. And it does an amazing job. And one of the projects, I hope to get it done soon, but currently going through right now is I'm using Eleven Labs to do the audio version of my book. So it's a massive project and it takes some tweaking in order for it to sound as, as human as we would like. But man, I, when I cloned my voice using 11 labs, it's really straightforward, really simple. You, you give it 30 seconds of your voice to listen to, maybe even less than that, 15 seconds. And it does, a, it blew my wife's mind. She's that is creepy as all get out. <laughs> Believe how close to you that really sounds. But you're right. That's exactly what I did. And I do a lot of talks for organizations here in Texas, and I work with the State Board of Education. And what I hear about AI from the vast majority of people are they're afraid it's going to take their job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly what I did with that avatar was I built that avatar. Actually, I used Mid Journey there to create that avatar, used Eleven Labs to clone my voice. And the little video intro that I did was if AI can recreate me using my voice and my image and it was a younger version of me. I looked about 10, maybe 12, the avatar that I did. 
But if AI can do all of this, where does that leave me? And where's the humanity of it all? And yeah. that's a huge question. And that's something that we have to look at. And one of the reasons I mentioned before that I wrote my book all except for chapter three using AI, but I had to write chapter three myself. And the reason I had to write chapter three myself is because it's the story of the red hat. Now, AI doesn't know the story of the red hat. It can't tell you why I wear this red hat or how it started with this Supreme hat that's back here in the background in a glass case, because that's the story of the red hat. It all started right there. I wore that hat too. Actually, it was a Podfest event at the Emily Arena in Tampa, Florida. And uh, I had that hat on and it's a Supreme hat, which Supreme is a lifestyle brand. And a friend of mine, he goes, dude, why are you wearing that Supreme hat on stage? Are they paying you? And I was like, no, I'm, I'm a middle-aged white male. They pay me not to wear it, to be honest with you. So he goes, then, then don't wear it on stage. He goes, but I love the red because I can see you all the way across the arena. So I went home and I tossed the Supreme hat to the side. And I bought a $6 unbranded flat build red ball cap off Amazon. And within months, I was the, uh, I was the red hat guy. <laughs> That's the story, a very revised version of where the red hat came from. But there was no way that AI was going to write that. And I use that as an example of that's where we don't need to worry about AI taking away our jobs. Uh. It's a tool. It's not a replacement. It's here to augment what we're doing. It's here to complement what we're doing and allow us to do things more effectively, more efficiently, in a much more timely fashion. But we're the operators. We're the humans. And we still have that emotional component and that emotional element and that human element. And we have that emotional intelligence that makes all the difference in the world. And as it sits right now, AI is just not there. Mm -hmm. People ask me, uh, is it ever going to get there? Do you ever see it getting there? And in, in all honesty, there, there's a five, five step roadmap of the future of AI. And at some point down that roadmap, long around step four, step five, they're conceptualizing an emotional component to AI. But is that five years down the road? Is that 10 years down the road? Is it 50 years down the road? We don't really know, but it's not there right now. I can tell you that much. Yeah. And it's not AI, and I'm not the first person to say this, but it's not AI that's going to take our jobs or remove us from the workforce. It's the people that understand how to use AI that's going to take all the jobs and push those that don't understand it to the wayside. So that's why it's absolutely critical that we get involved in AI, at least at a superficial level, we at least need to understand what it truly does and yeah. what those limitations are as well. Yeah, it's, it's really fascinating. Just, you know, it was like in the early 2000s, if you didn't have a website, you were SOL. And then it was like, then if you didn't know SEO, and it, or now, and, and I know people, my, like my parents' age, they were like, yeah, I don't want to use a cell phone. But if you didn't have a cell phone, your smartphone, you're SOL, really SOL today. Yes. You, you mentioned talking about education. And what's interesting is I'm increasingly in my conversations, I'm hearing that AI is going to make education like the traditional high school and college, all of these things fall by the wayside. They're going to be optional as opposed to what is your, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think we're at that stage right now. And actually <laughs> it's step two in that roadmap that I mentioned before out of the five steps. And step two is where everybody will have access to either their own virtual assistant that has a PhD level understanding of whatever your business or your niche is. And it's the same way for students. And it's already even getting there it, 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 along the way. If you look at uh, the Khan Academy and Sam and Khan wrote a, a book about it, actually. And they've got, God, I just, I lost the name of their tutor, but they have Conmigo that they built. And it's essentially a tutor for every student in the classroom. So it's really amazing that if you look at statistics, students that have the benefit of having a tutor excel in their classroom settings because they, they have that one-on-one -on -one individual attention and they can learn at their own pace. If you've got a student that learns a little bit slower, that tutor can get them up to speed. And then you've got some other students that are, they're bored sitting in the classroom because they're just on the next level. They're ready to rock and roll. Guess what? that tutor can give them that advanced instruction on whatever that subject matter may be as well. And with the Khan Academy, what they've done and what we're going to continue to see is the evolution of these individualized tutors for each and every student. This is going to revolutionize classrooms because no longer do you have one teacher in front of 35 to 45 students trying to keep everybody on the same page. <laughs> That's impossible. 
every 35 people are never going to be on the same page. So this eliminates that challenge and gives every student the opportunity to learn at their own pace and get that extra attention that they need, regardless of whether that's advanced attention or maybe that's remedial attention as well. So that's what we're starting to see. And we're going to continue to see that as we move forward. Yeah. They say, uh, I was reading an article where it's like, if you were born to a rich family or like these types of, you had these, if you know how to use AI, that's how it's like a huge advantage. That's like a gold mine type thing. Um, moving, uh, switching directions, um, talk about the uh, ethical considerations. Cause it's, we talked about jobs getting replaced and education being optional and talk about the ethical considerations with AI and creators and content and education. Yeah, it's a very broad subject. We can have a podcast completely on the ethics of AI. But if we're looking at it from a creator perspective, we have to start looking and asking ourselves, can we copyright the content that we're creating with AI? Is it actually our IP that we're creating or does it really belong to whatever chatbot we use to help us create it? And one of the best examples there is there was a gentleman that was a photographer. I cannot remember his name for some reason. I'm going drawing a blank, but yeah, he went on safari and he was going off to photograph monkeys okay, of different varieties of monkeys. And he set his camera up. It was ready to go. We had the lens on. He had everything set up perfectly. And he had to step away because nature called. Right. So he went and he <laughs> had this for a second. And when he came back, he had found that a monkey had taken several amazing pictures of itself with his camera. <laughs> so he comes back to the States after he's finished and he starts selling these prints. And PETA got involved and they actually sued him because part of the story was he didn't take the pictures. The monkey took the pictures. So he didn't have a right to profit off of something that the monkey did. And this is a real court case. You could look it up. It actually went to court, cost him a, somewhere between a quarter and a half a million dollars to defend himself. But he actually ended up winning the case because, well, one, monkeys can't hold IP. So that was one of the biggest reasons. But the other was, and this is where it is relevant, relevant to the AI conversation, was he set the camera up. He chose the lens. He set the aperture, the, the, the shutter speed. And I'm not a photographer, so I might be using these terms wrong. But he, he set everything up and made it so simple that a monkey could take an amazing photograph. And wow. that's really what won him the case was the fact that he was the professional and he set up everything necessary to make it happen. So we have to ask ourselves as AI generation and AI content creators, are we the professionals? Are we the ones that constructed the prompts that were necessary to get that data back and create the content? Are we the actual creators and we're just leveraging these tools? I, I use that as an example and at least get people thinking about, mm -hmm. yeah, people say you're cheating. And I, I catch flack all the time from real authors about my book. And that's great. My business partner, she wrote an amazing book and she's an, a real author, but I simply used a tool to do it more effectively and more efficiently. And, and I didn't show up again, empty handed. Next time I showed up to a talk, guess what? I had books in hand. So it served its purpose. Now at the same time, no, I'm never going to be, you're never going to write an AI generated book. That's going to be a New York times bestseller or a wall street journal bestseller. But uh -huh. guess that book behind me on this side, I always get them backwards. <laughs> <laughs> that book, it, it, it adds so much credibility and gives me so much positioning as a thought leader in the AI content generation space that it's extremely effective for what it does. Now, granted, it's little more than a 145 page business card, but it's super, super effective. And it can do the same thing for other content creators that are out there. Same thing with your podcast. From the ethics perspective, that's still, at least from a legal perspective, it's still up in the air. Yeah. Now, the right and patent office of the United States has declared that there has to be some human intervention in any AI generated content. Uh -huh. But the problem there is the sum has not been defined. Is some 5%? Is some 50%? Is some 85%? We don't know. And there's not, there's not many cases out there that have set precedents to determine exactly what that sum is defined as. So, for right now, we're still all learning about this together, but that's something that you want to consider going forward. And at least there's an argument to be made there that we are the prompting experts that allow us to create this AI generated content. Yeah, really. And there's, there's so much more we can dissect and just, cause I was thinking I'm always, I was trying to create a 
AI avatar clone of myself. And if I created presentations and speeches just through a single prompt, what does that you do for Hollywood actors and writers? And Sure. It's yeah. <laughs> if, you look, if you look back to the writer strike that just happened, we came out of a, what was it, last year, that where SAG, yes. the, the Writers Guild, went on strike. That was a large component to it. Well, there was a huge AI argument there uh, as to whether or not they have access to their own likeness and how pro Hollywood and producers can use their likeness and how they can use AI to generate replicas of their likeness. That was a major component of the writer strike. And I mean, we're starting to see them go back now. And, and I think they're, I heard something about a strike happening again here in the next week. So it's going to be a constant battle that's there. You know, when you start thinking about ethics too, from a different perspective is, you know, there's inherent biases to all of the data that's in these chatbots, because we have to consider that they're all trained on massive amounts of text data, whether that's articles, whether that's magazine articles, whether that's websites, whether it's if you're old enough to know what the Encyclopedia Britannica is, it doesn't matter. They've just loaded all this stuff in there. And we have to keep in mind that if there's biases in this data that's being used to train these bottles, guess what? There's going to be inherent biases that are in the output as well. So that's always something that we have to consider when we're using these platforms for content generation also. Yeah, I really loved it. And uh, thanks so much for coming on. How can people find you and follow you, your social media? I know you have programs that actually teach people how to leverage AI in their business and their as content creators, influencers, and so forth. Yeah, I do. I do AI content creation consulting, and you can find all the information there on my website. Super simple, LarryRoberts.com. <laughs> it's all right there for you. And if you want to follow me on social media, it's the Larry Roberts across all platforms. So I try to keep it as straightforward and as simple to find as possible. Yeah. Well, awesome. And again, for the audience, Larry is a legend in the field of AI content creation. And be sure to check out his socials and follow and check out his, all of his resources. And thanks so much for coming on. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.